watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Anna Babugati, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT therapist and newly minted EFT supervisor in fabulous Las Vegas. <laughs> and we have a very exciting guest today. We have Catherine DeBroom. She is one of the EFT trainers out of San Diego, and she's also from South Africa. And she has a lot of expertise in EFT, and she travels around the globe teaching EFT. And we're really excited to have her on our show today. And we are talking about self of the therapist in EFT. So thank you so much, Catherine, for being on our show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Excellent. So let's start off and, and maybe catch everyone up to what, can you tell us what we mean when we say self of the therapist? Because this is a term I never even heard of before I learned EFT like none of my grad programs talked about self of the therapist so I was like what yeah. the heck a therapist <laughs> that's what makes me so exciting that you chose this topic Annabelle because I think that once we understand the EFT model this is really where a lot of the work lies and this is often why people struggle to learn EFT. EFT is an exquisite model that will fascinate me for the rest of my life. But I think it is a hard model to learn because it's very hard to take people where we haven't been able to venture ourselves. And some of the things that get in the way of us venturing into this deep world of emotion is exactly the self of therapist. So when I think of self of therapist, I agree it's a new term, but it's certainly something that is undiscovered in the um, teaching programs, I think very intentionally, which is ironic to me because it goes right back to Freud who termed the coin transference. And so he initially talked about this very special relationship that gets created between the patient and the therapist and these unconscious processes that start to play back and forth like transference and counter transference. Um, so if you just look at the term transference, we're looking at the, our feelings, our desires, expectations of one person that are transferred onto the other person. And, and usually that's from the patient to the therapist. But of course, um, the therapist has the same thing happen back to the patient or the client. So I, the way that I like to simplify self a therapist is to think we were made to be, rela we're relational creatures, right? And so we're entering into a relational contract with our clients. And so of course, all of our self is going to be present and is going to get triggered and is going to reverberate and resonate and all of our own stuff is going to be on the table as well. And so I just think it's interesting that Freud talked about it, that Virginia Satir talked about it back in the 70s. And then somehow in our doctoral pro or in our whatever program we were in, uh, we were told, leave yourself out of it, right? Stay away from too much self-disclosure. Um, and yet, how realistic is that? Like, how can you leave yourself out of the room? I know I'm talking a mile a minute, but this stuff just excites me. I, was, I remember back to my master's program and one of my professors, Ben Lim, um, addressed the whole class and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we have very important tools in the therapy process. What do you think is the most important tool? And we were all there like really trying to get this answer right and we're throwing out, oh, it must be reflection. It must be uh, validation. I can think of so many. And none of us got it right. And he said, you know what? It's you. You are the most important tool in that therapeutic room. You are not considering yourself and how you play into the process, right? And isn't that like the key of EFT is that we are there as a relational being in a humanistic system, bringing all of ourselves and using attunement to build a secure attachment with our clients so that we can take them deep into their vulnerability using our own emotional system. That's right. So it's, it's, you know, when you say, you know, about the humanistic process, it's, and that relationship between the therapist and the client, we are just one human coming alongside another human. And most often that's what our clients are really wanting to know is that the person they're talking to can understand them and they feel that more. It yeah. feels like we're talking to a human being who can just be yeah. with, sit with me. Exactly. And so, I also hear you talk about a lot of really amazing things. So let me see if I can peel this back a little bit and sort of um, synthesize this. So what I hear you saying, and, and there's so many aspects to this. When we talk about transference and counter-transference, 
You know, I think it is a very delicate balance because you can't be, and, and I think it goes back to the psychoanalytic model where they wanted you to be a blank slate, you know, and your client projects things onto you. And so that's why you want to leave you out of it. But at the same time, you can't help but be in it because you are a human being with the brain and emotions and you're not a robot. So whatever you hear from your clients is bound to impact you and the way that they behave in session is bound to impact you. But also, you know, if you have stuff going on inside of you that maybe doesn't have anything to do with the client, but could be your own past trauma might get triggered, or maybe you just had a fight with your spouse before you walked into session or mm -hmm. you found out your grandma's in the hospital, whatever, and you bring that into session, then there's that, if it's imbalanced, you know, if we're not aware of what happens inside of us, then it can become about us. And that's, I think, what they mean by, you know, leave you out of it is that the, the therapeutic process isn't about you. And if you bring too much of yourself into it, then it can become about you. And it's not your therapy. It's about the client. But what I hear you saying is it's really self of the therapist is being aware and in tune with what happens inside of us as the therapist in session and in relationship to what's happening with our clients within session and knowing what might trigger us. And this runs right into EFT. And I think you're absolutely right. That's where a lot of folks I've noticed might shy away or avoid EFT because you know they do it an avoider does best. <laughs> like I don't want to confront those parts of myself because if I'm not comfortable going to those emotional places, those places in myself, I'm not going to be able to take my client there, right? And we know in order to have empathy, which is that EFT relentless empathy, then you have to be able to feel. And if I'm avoiding feeling those things, then I can't resonate in a way that allows me to be with my client and then I can't lead them down into the depths because I'm not willing to go. And, you know, as the other Catherine Ream says, we've got to get into the pool first, <laughs> you know, let them know it's safe. But if we can't get in the pool. Yeah. 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 So it's all of these processes that we run into and being aware of how that impacts our work and how that might show up in and out of the session. Yeah. A little bit more about that, how self love therapists might impact our work. Yes, thank you. I love everything you're saying. I'm just really resonating with you, Annabelle. Um, I love what you're saying that it's not, this is not an analytical process. We're not there to sit and analyze people. We're there to get alongside them, right next to them. And that's really what builds that relationship. And that's why we have been drawn to this model of EFT, right? It's the humanistic piece. And so alongside that experiential nature and getting into the pool ahead and with clients. Um, we're bringing our whole feeling system. Uh, the whole point is being able to be attuned and let your mirror neurons work and get into that intersubjective space using your right brain, connecting with their right brain and, and helping people learn how to tolerate emotion differently, right? And then reorganize it. So the way I think about it is it's actually like we need to practice what we're preaching. We're there to help people learn to regulate differently, how to broaden their window of tolerance. And yet we are taken to the edge of our window of tolerance in the session. And so those are the moments that are key where the self therapist is showing up. And like you said, it might be something that's going on in our lives and we just don't have as much emotional accessibility on a particular day. That's realistic. We just have to be open about that. Um, it could be something that the client is bringing up. They're reminding us of a grimace that our partner uses. They might look like someone we know. It might be a subject matter that's especially raw for us. I mean, they're just a million um, different things. But what's important for us to recognize is where is my window of tolerance and what happens for me in the moments that I start to dysregulate? And we're all so different, right? And so I think that's what we each need to be able to be, get curious about as EFT therapists is no, it's going to happen to all of us. It's already happening to all of us. There's nothing wrong with that. That simply makes us amazing human beings who are sensitive and we all have our limits, but actually 
those limits are not curses, they're blessings. This can become our very gift. But before we turn off and try to take ourselves out of the room in these moments, we actually have to tune in to the fact that, uh-oh, I just dysregulated. Now, I will tell you that I always wish that I had everyone else's coping tool because most people, I feel like when they dysregulate, they start talking a lot, kind of like I am right now. <laughs> but actually, when I get freaked out in a session, I go quiet. Like my mind just goes blank and I go still. And then I feel like now I'm outing myself. I'm the therapist. I'm supposed to know what to say, you know. That panic. <laughs> I find, so, so how do you respond in moments of dysregulation so that you can be there for yourself? What do you think in those moments? I, I mean, I get quiet and then I start thinking, uh-oh, I don't know what I'm doing. They probably think I'm stupid. I'm not being effective. Oh, my gosh, they're going to fire me. That is such an exercise train of thought that I know the moment I go there, uh-oh, clearly I'm dysregulated. Something happened that I'm dysregulated. And so just knowing your body reaction, what your tendency is to feel, do, and think, I think cues us into the fact that that's happening. And then we know that we're following a, a, a repair, a rupture repair model, right? It's not the fact that we get triggered. It's whether or not we can regulate ourselves in that moment to come back out of it. And then to ask the crucial question, is this just something about me? I would say most likely it's actually something about us. It's, it's our exquisite attunement that's tuned into something with the client that for whatever reason is resonating with ourselves. And because we're caring human beings who really want to make a difference, we get so freaked out. Oh, I brought myself into it. This must be something about me. But we throw the baby out of the bathwater and don't recognize, hold on. I'm feeling so much inside right now. I could really use this to come alongside this client in an even more effective way. Right. So this is all really, really important. And, and I see so much of this in the, the EFT therapist that I supervise and even in my own journey, you know, and this is part of EFT because it connects, because it gets to the heart of the matter in a way that other models don't. So even though therapists have done lots of self work, if they haven't done EFT, EFT will brush up things that maybe you didn't even realize were in the corner, right? When you're it will take a hold of your life, man. <laughs> yeah, it'll touch places that you didn't even think that needed to be repaired or looked at, and it will activate. And so part of the process, so part of putting ourselves, you know, the dual process of the model is like just as our clients will get dysregulated and we're looking at what happens within and between when they get dysregulated or triggered, we're looking at what happens for us as a therapist when something inside of us gets triggered. What are our fight or flight responses and how does that impact what, what happens in between, you know, or inside and what happens in between. And so an example, I love how you said you tend to go sort of like in the freeze mode and I see in myself, I noticed that I've, I always tend to go more in the fight mode. So if I had a client who would get really angry and start attacking me before I learned EFT and I didn't know what I was looking at, I would get very triggered by that and I would feel really defensive and I would almost get engaged in this little fight with them. And that was not a way to build alliance. It was rupturing alliance. And this happened when I was a baby therapist <laughs> and you know something that I had to go over with my supervisor and and it was so cool to be able to work through that like understanding what came up inside of you what happened mm -hmm. you know and when your client's getting triggered and they're attacking you of course you're going to go to this must be me when in fact it's not really about you it's about them right but we all have those little insecure moments and you know, they say a lot of people become therapists so they can fix themselves. <laughs> I don't know how much of that is true, but maybe a lot of it because a lot of us have a passion for helping others that the wounded, the wounded healer kind of mentality. We've been there and we want to help others through it. And I hear a lot of therapists struggle with the I'm not good enough kind of thoughts. And my tendency when I didn't feel good enough was to go into fight mode and get defensive but I have other supervisees that have noticed that they go into withdrawal mode. 
that they back away, they get quiet, and they go back into their head and they move away from the emotion. Mm -hmm. And then we looked at, so what happens in session when you're working with the client, when this happens, when you back away and you go back into your head, where are you in the model and in the process mm -hmm. and how does that impact them? And they're like, oh, the client doesn't need me to go back to my head. They need me to be able to stay there because this is what happens for them. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> it's really neat to see it's such a dual process. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And being yeah. aware of what are our own fight or flight responses. Not that, like you said, it's not that we're never going to get triggered because in fact we will, but really understanding what happens inside of us so that we can regulate that and even be able to say, okay, some, you know, some, like if my clients have intense trauma and they're sharing things, you know, there might be a bit of sadness. Anger is not the only emotion that might get triggered. And sometimes I will cry with the client, right? Sometimes things just come up so big. And I've had times where I've had to say, can we just take a moment? Because right now, this is a lot. This feels really heavy and I can feel it. And I'm feeling really sad as I hear you saying this. Could we just be with this for a minute and just slowing it down? Love that. Love that. Um, you are, yeah, you're, again, I just love everything you're saying, Annabelle, and you're talking about how this model really grows us. And I don't think you can become a good EFT therapist without letting it really touch your life. And I think that's what draws us to the model. We're so fascinated by it because we grow and learn so much about ourselves in the process. And so, um, you're also talking about this sort of this dual vision or this binocular vision. Like there's so much going on at the same time. We're trying to pay attention to our relationship with the clients, their relationship with each other, but then also our relationship with ourselves, right? And there's all these wheels that are reels that are sort of turning that we're trying to pay attention to. And I feel like it's just important for us to know that we are important too and what we need is important. And so to take a moment there to check in with ourselves is really good modeling. And if we can bring ourselves like a thermostat, if we can re-regulate ourselves, there's more of us available to the clients. Um, I, think, I think this is sort of shocking to say, I almost feel bad about saying it out loud, but the fact is that in mental health, you have like a normative population and then you have a clinical population. And most therapists come out of the clinical population, right? We're people who are drawn to this work because of our own childhood experiences and injuries and traumas. And I don't think that's a bad thing as long as we're looking at that and interacting with it and we're not letting that stuff hijack us. But I think in the moment with that self therapist stuff, it can range from a really tiny trigger with realizing, oh, oh, I'm getting a bit defensive or I'm like Catherine and I just freeze up and that feels so paralyzing. I'm like, at least if you're like Annabelle and you can sort of fight back, you can feel powerful. But when you're like freezing and you're the therapist and you know you're meant to say something like, what do you do, right? But it could, it could be on a continuum from a really tiny trigger that all it could take would be for you to, you know, look at a nice picture on your wall or to think about something or say, I'm doing my best or love the idea of just being transparent. We should talk more about that. But it could also range all the way to really hitting on some deep trauma that completely paralyzes you in the session and sends you into a tailspin. So um, recognizing sort of what you look like when you're dysregulated and how how deep that trigger goes, I think is really essential um, to helping us feel like we're effective therapists. And it starts with us being effective in helping ourselves in that moment. And it's important for us to help ourselves because then we're modeling to our clients and even to self-disclose that would not be a bad idea necessarily depending on the clients and where they're on the process. I love that. And I want to talk about that a little bit more, but I wanted to touch on something you said about, you know, therapists coming from the clinical population. It is, I think in a lot of ways, it really is a good, you know, they say experience is the best teacher and they can't teach you this stuff from a book. Right. And in a lot of cultures, you know, shamans, uh, a prerequisite to be a shaman in shamanistic cultures was that you had to have been sick or gone through some kind of illness, you oh. know, that 
where that wounded healer thing came from and it was considered an honor. So I said it's an honor, you know, that we've been so the mental health, you know, shamans of our time Mm -hmm. in the American culture, I guess, or whatever culture you're in. And you're going to be able to use that. I love how you talked about as a gift because it really is a gift Mm -hmm. because when we work through our own process, we have, a very experiential insight as to what it might be like inside the client as they try to go through this process. And you can use that as an access, not as a way that it's about you, but as a way that they sort of like a reference point where you can say, this is what it was like for me or what, what it feels like inside of me. Is this anything like what might come up for you? And then the clients are like, oh yeah, I know I'm not alone. I'm not you know weird or, or crazy for feeling this way. You know, and the fact that you're the therapist and you feel this way makes me feel so much better. Yeah, 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 exactly. So a lot of them are just really looking for, you know, again, someone to join with them and and using yourself as a tool, you know, again, is different than being hijacked or like how you said it, being hijacked and making it about you. So, you know, how do therapists really pay attention to and start to notice that process and what happens for them? Yeah, I think I really enjoy the supervision process. I was just sitting with in, in a consultation with a gentleman two days ago and having done about four consult sessions with him and watching his work and recognizing that he really wants to do deeper work and he's such a feeling creature, just such a lovely guy. But every time he has an opportunity to go a little deeper, he would get sort of cognitive and zoom out instead of really moving into that enactment. And so I just lightly reflected that, hey, it's so interesting to me that when you could push in, you actually back off and and, and sort of let this guy off the hook a little bit. And have you noticed that? And um, he was so curious and started to see it. And then it was an unconscious process for him that he really appreciated. And he said to me, oh, you know, I've heard that you guys do this in supervision. This is like that self therapist piece, right? Like we're getting into this now. And so he was, he started just being curious about that. He thought about it. I mean, one could journal about it. You could write about it. But mostly once, like you said, in the experience, once you've touched on that, the next time it comes up in the next session, I said, go into your next session with this couple and watch for that. It's probably going to happen again. And he brought me back the video to his next supervision and he actually pressed in instead of zooming out. And so it was so exciting. And then we moved on to the next piece. So um, I think like some folks are aware of these um, blocks For some of us, it's really a blind spot. I think that being in relationship with a peer or ourselves or with a supervisor and discovering this can be such an exciting, revealing process that can be so healing, like you said. I remember when I became an EFT therapist, um, gosh, probably like 12 years ago, um, I loved the deep stuff. I just loved diving into deep emotion But then my supervisor noticed that I would get stuck down there. And I remember having this feeling of going deep with someone and knowing, well, that's important. That's what you're meant to do in EFT. And I go into the sadness and the fear. And then I'd know, okay, you're supposed to come up into a step two and like summarize. But that process of coming up, almost like coming out of deep water, I could not orient myself. I was like dizzy, you know, I couldn't get back to the context like that deep emotion was just grabbing me and that was going on for a couple weeks or months until I realized I had my own unresolved grief so I was drawn to going deep because it resonated with pain and unresolved grief that I had within myself that I then I knew I needed to go there but I didn't know how to pull myself out of because I hadn't healed that with someone else yet and so I was struggling to help clients come out of that I struggled to feel hopeful that going into their sadness would actually bring um, organization because I hadn't experienced that myself yet. And so, gosh, EFT gave me such a gift of showing me the unresolved grief. And then once I did my own grief healing process, 
I was freed up to really speak about that in session and experientially help recreate that with others. It was really touching. That's really powerful. I love, I love that example and how you said that, you know, you were able to go really deep and, and I've noticed that even in myself that I, like Indiana Jones, I'm not afraid of deep emotion and, and <laughs> You know, part I think part of the self of the therapist too is being able to attune to the client just because I'm comfortable with it and I want to deep dive. You know, like, right? Yeah. Then, you know, and so they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, you're going too fast. But I love this idea of pulling up too fast, kind of like if you are like uh, scuba diving, you know, yeah. they bring you up at a, at a certain pace so that your lungs can reacclimate to the different pressure. Yeah. So that's Beautiful analogy as you describe that process and I have noticed this in a lot of therapists and that self of the therapist piece I know a lot of times it can actually be very healing and therapeutic you know I've often had some supervisees say this self of the therapist piece is supposed to feel almost like we just had therapy and I was like <laughs> it's healing this part of you because now you're recognizing how this part of you gets activated here and comes into play mm -hmm. and, and what's happening inside of you. And now we're organizing that experience in reference to your work, but because you're allowing it in, it's also healing those parts as we, you know, reorganize that. And I think obviously if, if a therapist is getting really dysregulated, it might be, a, you know, a little bit step further might be needed where they might need to go see their own therapist, you know, mm -hmm. but a lot of healing can happen just out of that organization. And I like how you mentioned your, your um, supervisee, how he would pull out and go up to his head, you know, cognitive. And I've seen that a lot, especially as the clients like to apply that pressure that we're not changing fast enough. Give me, give me something. Or, you know, we're looking for cues, just like our clients are looking for cues with each other. We're looking for cues on the client's face that what we're saying is resonating with them, that's yeah. having an impact. And yeah. I've noticed a lot of therapists, if they don't see, if they see just the, the still face, that they start to get dysregulated. They're like, oh no, I'm yeah. this, they're not getting it or I'm not doing it yeah. good enough. This is right, me. Right, right, right the skills and then they go back up and, and start doing almost like a CB, CBT version yeah. of, of EFT, you know, they go like psycho ed, like, wait, 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 what just happened there, right? But I love, and in, in, in exploring that, I found that there's a lot of, you know, attachment trauma that will come up for therapists around not feeling good enough. And that plays out in their clients when they're looking for that sign that I'm good enough as a therapist to help you and heal you. And I love how you talked about how you were drawn into those deep emotions because it resonated with something inside of you. But then, you know, not really getting grounded in the model, kind of losing your footing mm. and realizing what is that connected to when I lose my footing? That's so beautiful <laughs> the way you describe that. Uh, you just made me think about, um, re I think my most recent work on this with myself was just a couple months ago. I started realizing I'm sitting on this comfortable chair, but sometimes I'm not comfortable. I'm like leaning forward and I'm not like, and I started saying, why am I sitting in this way? Why am I leaning forward so much? I mean, we generally know we don't want to go into that withdrawn position or be too much of the pursuer. How can I just be completely comfortable with these folks, with what they're bringing in the room? And am I in a place in that humanistic model where I really trust the process and trust that if I create an open, safe space, people have that self-growth potential and that's going to happen. And it's not about me working too hard or trying too hard or making it happen. And so just starting to recognize my own attitude and do I feel like I have to make this work? Am I working harder than they? Am I comfortable with them taking the time and the space that they need to? I'm more than happy to be active in the session, but am I possibly being too active? And I recognize that in how I was sitting. So I've been feeling, uh, just being more mindful about that and sitting back and relaxing more and 
and somehow there just feels like there's more containment and space in the session for more to come up. So um, that's been really fun recently. That's really neat. So are there different aspects of self to the therapist that you notice come up that maybe like there's some commonalities that you notice come up when you're working with therapists? Oh, that's a great question. I haven't thought about that before. I, I mean, the one that I've noticed the most in terms of EFT training is that people are attracted to the model, but are very uncomfortable with their own emotional process. And to me, those are the folks who struggle the most because EFT is just so much about attunement and diving into emotion. Right. And, and um, those and, or in those therapists, I find one of two responses, kind of like our own clients, so either they'll start avoiding going deeper with the model and they'll kind of drop out of their EFT training because they're coming up against that part of their own emotional process, or they'll, they'll really decide, okay, this is something I, I want to face down and I'm going to go for it and they'll go deeper. Which yeah. Is so yeah. 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 I mean, some of us are just so drawn to this, right? I could be on a therapist's couch all day long, man. You could pay me to go to therapy. <laughs> like, I'm like, why wouldn't you want to go in and talk about all this deep stuff? But I think part of that is how we teach the model and letting folks know ahead of time what they're signing up for. The same way that when we're meeting with clients, you know, the California ethics is to let them know what model they've signed up for and what we're going to be doing with them. But um, when we train in EFT, we're so excited about the model and it's transformed our lives so much that we want people to sort of join the club. But it is important for them to know it's, it's, a, it's a hard model to learn and it's going to really take some time. And it is going to require you looking deeply into yourself because this is really about our attunement and emotional accessibility and having that online. And so that's, that's the process that you're signing up to engage with. And is that something that you want to do? Otherwise, folks start doing it and then they struggle. And then maybe they think that's not normative or they don't have community support to help them deal with that. And so, I mean, in my years of going from EFT therapist to supervisor to trainer, it was really my journey of learning how to co-regulate because I grew up self-regulating. I grew up in a boarding school. And so I was very self-reliant and independent, which worked great for my life until I started teaching this model and realizing I need to learn how to, how to lean on other people and actually regulate in that way. And so that's where the EFT community, I think, is essential. And it does become like a family or at least you find those people who are in your tribe. But are you willing to engage with that part of the process? Otherwise, it can become very frustrating or sort of soul-destroying. I really like that. And that's something I never really considered was this idea of, of helping therapists understand more deeply what they're signing on for, what it means to be an EFT therapist and the, the process that is going to be involved, what it requires of them as a, as a person. Um, and how you know what their regulatory uh tendencies are they you know self-regulate do they know how to co-regulate and and that's so interesting that you talked about you know if they're in a small community they don't have a lot of community support that that is really hard that can be a dilemma to get connected with someone in their area especially if maybe the other therapists in their area come from more psychodynamic and they don't really understand attachment then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that can activate some trauma or create some attachment trauma as you're trying to learn this very delicate and intimate process, even in yourself in context of your work. And then you're getting these negative messages on the outside from other therapists. That, that can be really hard. So having, I love that having a community as you do this is so important, so important for that supportive yeah. piece and normalizing the needs and the longings that we're going to have in learning the model and recognizing how easy or hard it is for us to risk and reach mm -hmm. and then to start figuring out how to practice that. I mean, like the other, it's not like, I don't, what I don't want to say is that people always have to go to supervision or consultation every time a self a therapist piece comes up because that certainly isn't the case. I think one can really lean on self-supervision if you're someone who can get curious. It really requires getting curious 
and wanting to know yourself more. And you can do that through journaling again or artwork or um, thinking about it, but also um, just having a buddy system. I really like a lot. Sometimes on the way home from work, if I've struggled with a client, I just call up a buddy and I just say, Hey dude, can I just be my client for a couple minutes and then you be the therapist. And if I just go into that state of being my client, mm-hmm. I can often figure out where they're stuck and therefore where I'm getting stuck with them and therefore why I'm getting stuck because of my own stuff. Yeah. But you need to have that buddy system up and running. Um, I, and I don't think that we've stressed that enough in, in EFT that, especially when you're first learning is to have that buddy system. And I, I had a buddy just cause I knew I really wanted to do this. I kind of took it as a challenge. Um, you know, when Sue talked about how holistic the model is and there's really, you know, all the answers are in attachment. So I was like, okay, if I can really stay in the model and, and solve these problems or find the solution in attachment, then I want to find a way to do that. So noticing my own tendency when I wanted to pop out of the model would mean it's not the model, it's probably something inside of me that's coming up or, you know, whether that's a skill set or my own emotional block. So and I would have my, my buddy and we were sort of going through this together after our sessions and be like, okay, this is where I got stuck today. Can we talk about that? Can you help me with this? You know, and, um, you know, he never once, bless his heart, never once got tired and said, no, you can't, you can't call me anymore. Talk to me about cases, <laughs> you know, but eventually I got, you know, as I learned the model more, I, I relied on him less and less, but it was really cool to have somebody that I could call and talk to after session. And oh, say, yeah. Right. Someone who's in, who's also learning the model, who's just as fascinated, um, that resonates with you. That makes such a difference. Mm -hmm. So that sort of points me in a, in the opposite direction of also where we can get hurt. I think in the EFT community is when we come into this community and we think, okay, we're all here learning attachment. That means that everyone's going to have secure attachment with each other, which is absolutely not possible, right? You can only have a couple of those relationships in your life. And so sometimes we go to EFT trainings or supervision groups, and we think that we're going to become buddies with everybody. And then it doesn't happen. And then we feel so incredibly hurt. And I always try to uh, warn folks at externships and core skills about that as well. We're, we're, we're setting up affiliatory, you know, attachment relationships with folks with the idea of learning the model better, but not everyone's going to resonate with each other. And if you don't, you know, that's okay too. Yeah. And I love that. That is really important to notice, you know, when we're getting to know other EFT therapists, we could sort of assume, oh, you're an EFT, you must already have secure attachment. And maybe we're working yes. through our stuff and trying to learn and build secure attachment. So we can sort of have these expectations and then feel really hurt and almost you know, I've heard some people say that they almost felt like betrayed, but then the model got blamed. Like, mm-hmm. I feel betrayed by the model. And it was really oh, the yeah. of a therapist between, you know, with that other therapist. And, you know, yeah. not really, even, even if they have secure attachment, you know, there's still, you know, people are going to get triggered. And this was something yeah. I yeah. learned in my own self love therapist work was, putting on my EFT lens and trying to have empathy and be in someone else's shoes, even if they're an EFT or, you know, this happened at an externship I was helping with and, and I made a comment and it was unsolicited. And I just saw this look from the trainer, mm. no words, but the look, and it was like the Viper death look. And I was like, Uh Oh, oh God, I felt terrible. Oh. And I don't even think the trainer knew it, but, Mm. You know, I felt like, oh my gosh, do they not know how important they are to me that, that, you know, that I look to them for safety and here I'm getting that look in front of all these people. But then I sat and thought, what if I was the trainer and somebody was doing this to me, what would I feel? And I realized that trainers are not superhuman, (laughs) you know, and you guys are awesome, but you're human too. And Mm -hmm. 
you're looking for us to us also for signs of safety and yeah. you need it as much from us as we need it from you yeah if you don't feel like you know a warm reception if you're not feeling like the community is open to your teachings or to your style then then yeah. that can create some feelings on the inside so i realized maybe what i was doing was sending a danger cue to the trainer and that yeah, was yeah 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 oh <laughs> <laughs> oh how cool that you could put yourself in the mind of the other you know yeah yeah and and it really took getting grounded in the model to say what do i know about behavior oh behavior is attached to the danger cues right mm -hmm. so and i know this person is really good and and really validates me most of the time so for them to yeah. do something like that i knew something must yeah, be happening yeah. I, it was just so profound to realize that wow. even a supervisee or a, a young EFT that, that, you know, we could send it easily. Right, right. I know I love what you're saying because I think it goes to the heart of attachment. It's not about setting up a safe therapy environment where everyone's safe all the time or a safe training environment. There is no such thing. People are in a relationship and they're going to trigger the heck out of each other. And so do we have a, a context for dealing with triggers, right? So whether we're in our therapy session with our clients and say, hey, I'm still getting to know you. I don't know how to read your signals. There are going to be times that I've got something going on with me. But what I'm committed to is working on our relationship. And so if I'm feeling sick today, I might say, hey, guys, just so you know, my energy is a little low. I had a headache. I'm here with you right now. But if I seem different, that's what it is. We're committing to being transparent, but more importantly, in this model, whether we're training or in therapy, we're committing to rupture and repair there's always going to be rupture but we're committed to the repair process so now anytime i'm training i stand up there and i say gosh i want to create a safe environment safety is not from me safety is in the context of the relationship i want it to be safe but i know that i can't promise that i know that i'm going to trigger you guys even when i don't want to because i'm a certain person from a certain context certain culture but when i trigger you i would love it if you could let me know and I will be committed to trying to work through that and work on myself so that I try not to do that again. Um, but we're in this, this very small sort of microcosm culture where we're all committed to attachment theory and working on deep stuff with each other. And we come from context or communities where that's not important or that isn't happening. And so I'm just knowing that I can't go out of all my other buddies and start having these deep conversations, they'll think I'm nuts. <laughs> And so not getting hurt by thinking that the whole world wants secure attachment because in many contexts, they're not looking for that. So again, just noting these are the few places that I can go in these moments that I'm feeling vulnerable safely. And there's other times that I need to have my coping strategies up and keep those defenses in place because that's necessary too, you know. Which I'm going to be totally nerdy right now and say that's a self of the therapist step six where you see and accept where the other person is at oh i like that nice <laughs> you know seeing see, like you know recognizing you know if they're not in a place where they're not looking for secure attachment they may not be a place where i can have that deep conversation you know see and accept <laughs> you yeah. know yeah. So which is so cool and then you know where you can go to ask yeah. for student yeah start to lean on those the same way that in the session, when you're having a trigger come up, that's not the time to go internal and go do a deep dive into your childhood experience, right? It's a time to get curious and accept, oh, I just had a block come up. How interesting. And being able to be transparent in that moment and say, gosh, I need a moment to think about this. Wow, here I'm being quiet because I'm really thinking about what's coming up. But then putting the block aside and then figuring it out later, right? And then moving on. So let me see if I can sort of tie a bow on everything that we talked about. So really, you know, again, self of the therapist is the process that happens inside of us in context of the therapy session and in relationship with uh, our clients and others, right? And making sure that, you know, the way that we really start to intervene on self of the therapist is get curious we get curious and start to notice and attune not only to the client, but to ourselves, ourselves in relationship to the client. What sort of things might come up in the therapy room that trigger something inside of us 
and then start to pay attention to what our own action tendency might be, what our fight or flight responses are and how that might move us towards or away from the client and is that strategy keeping us grounded in the model in service of the client or bringing us away from where we need to go with them and noticing that process and getting curious about it and you know being able to talk about it when it needs to be talked about in session can can we hold on for a second something just happened right or if we need to just okay, I need to bookmark that and come back to that outside of session and work on this with my supervisor, you know, and having, having supervision and community support is really good. And as you start to grow and really learn and, and really are courageous about getting curious with yourself, you're able to do a lot of that self supervision as well, but it's always good to have a buddy mm -hmm. and, you know, really just understanding how, that impacts your work and, and noticing the process that happens and where are you in your own part of the model inside yourself and with the client when self the therapist comes up, which is really cool. And it, it's not about us, but you know, if we're getting triggered and hijacked, then it does in a way become about us because it's taking us away from where we need to be with the client. Mm -hmm. So being able to pay attention, being hijacked may look different for everybody, depending on your fight or flight responses. Like for you, Catherine, you so lovely said that you sort of go into that freeze response. A lot of therapists go into the flight response where they move away and up into their head, or some of us might go into the fight response. <laughs> and, <you know. laughs> and being aware of how any of those might impact the relationship or the therapeutic process and being mindful of how can I stay grounded in those moments. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's so much here. I feel like we could really talk forever, but I know we're limited on time. So now, Catherine, you do a lot of self of the therapist uh, training and supervision. Can you talk more about like what workshops you do, what publications you might have? Yes, uh, thanks Annabelle. I just want to thank you again so much for having me on the show and just want to send out a, a hi to all the listeners and wish you all the best as you keep working on your EFT journey. And I'm in San Diego. My website is katherinedebruin.com and you can access my calendar on there. I do some trainings in South Africa and then in various places in the US and I provide online supervision and support. So you're welcome to contact me. I'd love to hear any comments you have about what we've talked about today um, or just be in touch with you in any other way. Awesome. And they can get in touch with you through your website? Yes, correct. Perfect. And if they're interested in scheduling you to come out to their area, they just get... Um, get in touch with you and you guys would coordinate that. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because, you know, the trainers, they are available to travel to you and sometimes they can do webinars. So definitely if you're interested in having Catherine to bring out to your area to talk about self love therapist and EFT, which is fabulous. And really we could do a whole one or two day training on, you know, absolutely get in touch with her. I will make sure that we put a link to her website in the description for this video. And, you know, just thank you again so much, Catherine, for being such with us. a pleasure. Thank you. really appreciate you. And thank you so much to our listeners, to our viewers. Make sure that you guys hit subscribe because more episodes are on the way.